In this lecture series, we've talked a little bit about CSS. And what I would like to do in this lecture is to introduce some ways in which we can leverage CSS in a powerful way in order to allow our web designs to be responsive to different kinds of environments in which they're being observed and being experienced. We're going to call that process responsive web design. This is part one of a two-part lecture series, and my name is Professor Don Patterson. The key points that I want to draw out in this lecture are that web designs should respond to their environment. Bootstrap is one particular web framework that supports designers in achieving this. It's very powerful, very fast. So how responsive is responsive? Ideally, we would love for our websites to be responsive to a very deep and rich context. We would like our websites to be different and respond differently based on our location and based on our time. And in some ways, it does. Sometimes we'll get different suggestions based on where we are. And maybe we'll use a, a black theme or a light theme, dark theme or light theme, depending on what time of day it is. But we would also like our websites or our computers in general to be um, responsive to our intent and our emotions and our capacities. We would like our websites to recognize when we are not fully paying attention. Maybe if we have their accessibility concerns like being visually impaired, maybe we are on the run trying to catch a bus, or maybe we're angry, or maybe we're hungry. All these different kinds of conditions of our very physical human body that affect our ability to work with computers. But for the most part, computers don't do much to um, adjust in that way. It would be great if that was responsive as well. It would also be great if they could respond to things like the weather or the ambient social environment so that our applications did one thing when we were in a movie theater and the movie was playing and another thing when the movie was over. These are all kinds of ideals that you see coming from the ubiquitous computing community or being referenced from that community and that are slowly being introduced in various ways um, in the you know, more um, less research environment, more commercial and more product oriented for the purpose of this lecture, though, when I talk about responsive, I'm going to really pare that down. What I'm just focusing on is being responsive to the screen size and the screen orientation and doing a graphic or aesthetic design that respects that, that particular condition. Our strategy for addressing this is going to be to try and introduce just one HTML, CSS, JavaScript code base that's going to be able to respond to many different screen sizes and many different screen orientations. And we would like this because that would be really easy to maintain if we could figure out a way to do that. The alternative is not very promising. It would mean that we would have to have one different website for Firefox than we have for Chrome. We would need a different website for a mobile platform than a desktop platform. We would need a different website for a horizontal iPhone and a vertical Pixel phone, for example. And then maybe something different for Kindle and Watch and all the different ways in which a website can be experienced would have to have a completely different website that was written specifically for that environment that would then have to be tested in all those environments and would have to be maintained as changes to your website were made across all those environments. So that's a really, um, that's a prospect that just seems kind of untenable. Ultimately, what would end up happening is the dominant platform would be addressed and all the other platforms would maybe not have a product associated with them at all. And as we see the number of different ways in which we can encounter web content, it's hard to even target one particular web browser, operating system, context, device, whatever we might have in mind, um, and meet any significant portion of the market. So we would like one code base that's going to render correctly or at least aesthetically well on multiple different platforms. That's challenging because if you think about the number of different devices that are out there, iPads, iPhones, Kindles, HTC, Google devices, watches, you know, all kinds of uh, the Tesla dashboard, all kinds of Internet of Things, each one of them has a different kind of screen resolution, viewpoint size, density of the um, screen, etc. So for example, the Android device OnePlus 9 Pro has a resolution of 1440 by 3216. That would require one kind of aesthetic layout. We drop down and maybe look at an iPhone 12. 
that has 1284 by 278, 2778 pixels. The viewport's even different than that. That's a different presentation. Maybe look at a Google Pixel 5, 1080 by 2340. You know, and you look at all of these devices going by, they each have different resolutions and screen sizes. And there's a lot of different devices that are currently in use in the environment right now, in our, you know, in our moment in time, all the way down to your Apple iPhone 10, 1125 by 2436. That's a challenge. Oh, oh, but wait, the challenge isn't done because remember each one of those devices can be rotated and you have a different browser entirely with a completely different screen size now. What about the desktop environment? So don't forget that in a desktop browser, you also have an arbitrary number of sizes. Maybe someone's gonna maximize their window and completely fill their screen with your website, or maybe they're gonna tuck it down into a corner in a little postage stamp size window, just waiting for a change or waiting for a notification. How can we handle all of these different presentations and still communicate a branding and an aesthetic and effective design um, for what we want to accomplish? Well, the strategy that we're gonna employ is a design that's based on grids and columns. And this is a particular design language that has been developed by magazine layouts um, for quite a long time. So here's a screenshot of uh, a particularly aesthetically strong uh, magazine called Dwell. It's an architecture interior design kind of magazine. And I'm going to overlay on this screenshot some of the grid line um, frame, some of the grid guidelines that are present here. You can see that there are some pretty strong places where grids are laid out. What our strategy is going to be is going to be to use CSS to create different kinds of columns, grids, and rows, and then allow our browser to lay those grids out or use this particular set of rules in order to lay out those grids and rows in different ways depending on the size and shape of our screen. We're going to leverage a CSS library in order to do that. Here's a particular website that's been built with grids in mind. And this is a particular grid format where I'm, where I'm going to overlay the grids for a second. And you can see that a lot of the components on this particular website, the Drupal software package, start and end on particular grid lines. The, the um, pink represents the grid and the white represent what we call gutters along the way. So we're going to leverage this grid idea and we're going to try and use that grid in order to develop websites that work on all these different platforms. The challenge for this though, is that getting this right for all the different web browsers and all the different platforms out there is very, very difficult. And that's because the CSS and platform glitches that are present on all the different platforms are very complex. So these are just a couple screenshots that I took of different sort of variants of CSS, variants of HTML, that you might have to introduce just to ac accommodate one particular platform or another. So in many ways, doing this particular work of different CSS for different platforms and different HTML for different conditions isn't really solving the problem for us because it's effectively having to write a bunch of different code bases that are targeted towards different platforms. So what we'd like to do is abstract this away a little bit and work with one particular library that does this work for us? And we can think about interacting with the library and then allow the library to deal with all the different changes. We're going to do this by loading an external CSS style sheet. We're going to use one that's um, been developed by an organization called Bootstrap. It's called Bootstrap. And this CSS external library will have all of this grid functionality built in for us. It will be very, it's very effective at helping us to develop this responsive ability but it does come with some constraints. And those constraints are that if you're going to use this library as a designer, you're required to work within the system that it defines. If you want the power of that responsive design and that grid layout, you can have it, but you also have to accept some of the design constraints that come along with it. And that basically means you have to use uh, this library to, to make it work. So the responsive design system that we're gonna talk about today is Bootstrap. It's one of many different design systems that are out there, but it's a particularly powerful one and one that you've probably seen before and maybe not realized you were looking at. Some of its benefits are that it's free and open source. 
it's free meaning it doesn't cost anything, but it's free also in that it's open source and it doesn't have any licensing constraints. This particular library started as a project at Twitter. At that time, it was called Blueprint, and Twitter eventually released it into the public domain, and now it continues to be developed um, by, by volunteers, I think, um, but certainly it remains free and open source. It's primarily a CSS library, meaning you load it into your document, and although you don't have to look at this, what it is is just a bunch of selectors and rules, different fonts and colors and um, layouts and sizes, things that you might write manually, but that someone else has written for you. And if you know how to interact with it, you don't have to work with the details of the external style sheet. It does have a few other components, for example, a little bit of JavaScript that help to make all the pieces work together smoothly. Some people don't like the fact that it comes with a particular aesthetic um, uh, that, that is part of the whole design system. And I kind of understand that. Uh, you can still get a lot of the benefits of the bootstrap system though and not have to accept the aesthetic because there are some straightforward ways in which you can theme it differently if you're so inclined. So we're going to be describing Bootstrap 5. Uh, you can see this is from their splash screen. It says build fast, responsive sites with Bootstrap. You can quickly design and customize responsive, mobile-first sites with Bootstrap, the world's most popular front-end open source toolkit. So I, I don't know about that claim of it being the most popular front-end toolkit, source toolkit, but it certainly is a very powerful, effective, and well-engineered system. Some other details there as well. So here's a basic template of what a bare bones bootstrap document, HTML document looks like. And this, most of this code has been taken from the bootstrap website. So I just want to point out a few components that are present here. So for starters, this just exists within an HTML5 document. So we specify HTML the way we typically would. In the head section of our document, we have a couple meta tags that I don't know that we've introduced in this lecture series at all, but it does a couple things for us. So the first meta tag just indicates that the character encoding in this file is UTF-8, Unicode. The second one initializes our browser so that it treats the viewport in a way that Bootstrap expects, whether it's a desktop platform or a mobile platform. So this just sort of creates a, a, a palette that Bootstrap can work with so that the behavior um, is as Bootstrap wants it to be. This is just boilerplate. We just cut and paste it. The next piece loads that CSS file from Bootstrap for us. This is a link to an external CSS style sheet. And it looks a little complicated, but if you dig into it, actually the components are things that we've mostly seen already. For example, there is a reference to an external IRI that starts with the protocol HTTP HTTPS, it goes to a domain, cdn.jsdeliver.net. That's a particular content delivery network, that's what CDN stands for, that volunteers to host this CSS file for anyone on the internet that wants to use it. And again, we get the benefits of caching because if someone else, if another website uses the same link, then when we use it, it's already present on a user's computer and it, we can use the cached version. You can see that we've got that href, we can see that it's a style sheet, you can see that there's an integrity attribute. What that integrity attribute does is it presents a fingerprint of the file that we're downloading. And so the browser is going to compare the file that we downloaded, the CSS file, and check to see that its fingerprint matches the fingerprint listed here in the integrity attribute. And the reason why we do that is because we don't want some malicious third party on this jsdeliver.net site to introduce CSS that we don't expect. And so this maintains the integrity of the file so that we know we're getting that, the code that we expect to be getting. And then the cross origin tag, cross origin attribute just um, asks the browser to enforce that integrity. We see that we have a title for our document and then in the body, we just have a single headline that says, hello world. And then at the very bottom, we have the second bit of bootstrap code we haven't talked about JavaScript very much in this lecture series, but what this does is it loads an external JavaScript file, code that gets run within our website and um, is also from an external site. You can see same thing. We've got a, um, an IRI or URL from an external site. We've got an integrity fingerprint. Um, and what this does is just provide some of the glue and a little bit of the feedback for our user interface components. Very basic setup. When we take this and we render it in a website, we get a very simple website. 
it just says hello world. Um, and that's just kind of to get us up and running with Bootstrap 5. Just wanted to demonstrate that. In this, in this particular lecture, that's all I want to do. I just want to introduce the motivation for responsive design, introduce you to Bootstrap 5, and in, in, another, in part two, we'll look at some of the details of Bootstrap in particular. But for further reading, if you're interested in some of the background of where responsive design came from or how people developed it, I would point you to a few articles. The first article is one of the first um, articles that advocated for responsive design. And it used an architecture metaphor in order to talk about the way in which design structures our interaction with environments. The quote here is, creative decisions quite literally shape a physical space, defining the way in which people move through its confines for decades or even centuries. Working on the web, however, is a wholly different matter. Again, this quote is talking about the state of web design before responsive design. The second quote, for many websites, creating a website version for each resolution and new device would be impossible, or at least impractical. Should we just suffer the consequences of losing visitors from one device for the benefit of gaining visitors from another, or is there another option? So this is, again, is part of the argument for introducing responsive design. And then finally, if you're interested in going to the documentation for Bootstrap itself, you can go to the website getbootstrap.com, the authoritative location for Bootstrap, and look at the documentation there, perhaps for version 5, getting started. That's where I want us to just begin. I, I want to argue and uh, explain why websites should respond to their environment, how maybe websites in the future will respond to their environment besides just screen size and orientation, although screen size and orientation is a good place to start. And then also introduce Bootstrap as a strong, powerful CSS and a little bit of JavaScript web framework for supporting designers in achieving a one-size-fits-all web application. Thank you for your attention.